talk is going to be kind of uh, improvement, <coughs> drills for improvement of compulsory tumbling relative to levels three through five. Yeah. Kind of the, the, the theory going into this level of clinic is going to be that the kids have been introduced to competitive gymnastics already. They already have their round offs, they have their back handsprings, and they're trying to get better at them. We're trying to get to the point where we're able to incorporate some stronger, more powerful tumbling into their compulsory routines for improved scores. So these are not going to be necessarily drills that we use for teaching these skills. They're going to be for drills that we use for making them longer, more powerful, straighter, um, things of that nature that hopefully will lend themselves to improvement as they and bridge the gap from compulsories into optionals. Uh, there's some pretty neat stuff here, some of which you probably have seen, some of which may be a little bit new, but as I do any of these lectures, the, the, kind of the idea behind this, and what I hope you notice most is, is really more of the attention to detail, uh, the, the shapes that the kids are using or trying to use, and, to, and also understand that in all of my DVDs, these are, these are kids that were this level. Okay? This is not a bunch of level 10s doing level 5 tumbling. These are kids that were the level at the time that, that we had the, the DVDs produced. So it, it gives you maybe a little better understanding of kind of what we're looking for, but they will be making certain mistakes. Not everything is going to be perfect, uh, but more, more similar to what you would see hopefully in your own gyms and really striving to, to reach that next level of efficiency and, and technique and form and execution and all those good things. Okay, but the first thing we're going to do, and, and as always, I always start my stuff with some physical preparation or prerequisites. And these are um, stuff that I don't think needs to be written in stone, but I didn't mention in bars earlier today is that I really highly recommend having some prerequisites, whether it's in your mind or on paper. It's a great way to communicate not only amongst your staff and your athletes, but with their parents. So if you've got any, any reasons why you know kids couldn't move up from one level to the next, things of that nature, by having things that are they're kind of documented, um, your communication avenues will open up between you and your parents and make your life a lot easier. For example, in our program for our optional requirements and our, our requirements to moving from level to level, it's in our team handbook, it's, it's posted on a wall, so when those occurrences do happen where you have an athlete that's very close to moving up but doesn't have quite everything that's needed, instead of it becoming like a thing that's personal maybe in, in their parents' mind, you don't like my daughter, things of that nature. If you have a document at all, that goes away. Okay? It's something that can be written. It's something you can refer to. You can show them, and it makes it very clear, and it makes it very professional instead of becoming sometimes personal and emotional. So it's something that I really recommend, especially when dealing with girls and dealing with their mommies. Okay? It's something that really will save you a lot of time. All right? Uh, back to physical prep real quick. And these are just things that are not... They're just things that I really look for, um, not, not only in our own kids, but if, I, if I'm coaching at clinics or camps, just some of the things that we'll ask the kids to be able to, to show us, to kind of ensure that they're ready strength-wise, flexibility-wise, shaping-wise, before we try to, um, again, incorporate drills that hopefully are going to make their tumbling a little bit longer. When you start lengthening tumbling, you're, having, you're talking about having to add a lot more power and a lot more dynamics. When you're asking your athletes to be more powerful and more dynamic, they better be physically prepared for they're going to get hurt. Okay, so it's, it's important that they're in, in, um, in the correct shape and in the correct strength level, again, like I spoke of earlier, to be able to do what you're asking them to do. Okay, you make corrections as coaches. Very rarely is it, is it issues with coaching that the coach doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay, a lot of, most of the times, their athletes are not physically prepared to do what they're being asked to do. Okay? You can know exactly what you want to tell an athlete. You can know all these drills and all these, these exercises to do it, but if they're not physically prepared to do it, you're going to be beating your head against the wall. Okay, so just five or six little things for as far as physical prep. Number one is going to be um, punching and, and kind of uh, what we call pogos or in, in, inverted pogos and upright pogos. But very simply stated, and this, this is again trying to get kids probably from level two to moving upwards through the levels, and just very tight punching, okay, very simple. Then if you were to go back to your gym, and I was on a vault runway, so it's, it's pretty stiff, and go ask your little guys to all put their arms up, keep them straight above their heads, and bounce down the runway in releve, or, or punching off of their ankles, 
without sticking their ribs out, without bending their arms, without moving their heads back and forth and doing it in a very tight manner. It's a lot harder sometimes than you might think. Okay, and sometimes it's a, step, it's a step that we skip a little bit. Also, the definition of what punching is, I think that the kids sometimes get confused with that. Um, punching, and I'll, I'll make it as simple as I can, at least if it makes it simple in my mind. Uh, punching is, is kind of to tumbling as, as blocking is to vaulting. Okay, so a punch is something that's done with pretty straight legs or when the legs flex very, very slightly and there's an explosion there through the joint or there's just a very slight flexion and jumping obviously is a much broader range of motion. We want to punch when we tumble, not jump. If you're jumping out of your round offs, you know, really squatting down, things of that nature that we see a lot of, the kids are going to, the, the, their ability to do longer back handsprings is going to be definitely inhibited. So if, we, so if we can really teach the kids the difference between punching and jumping, it's like the difference between blocking and pushing on vault. When we do a front handspring vault, if we push off the vault, what are we going to get? Archy, not very dynamic mess. Okay, it's the same kind of thing with tumbling. We want to we punch when we tumble, not jump when we tumble. So to get the, get the kids to understand the difference, um, we also block when we tumble as well. That's, that's what this little drill will demonstrate. These are called inverted pogos. You can do them on a tumble track, arrow board, vault board, uh, just something that has a little bit of flexion to it so that they can bounce. Uh, there is a demonstration on the vault board. But being able to display these inner dynamics or this internal body tension when they're tumbling is very, very important. Um, if they're very loose in their lower back, if their core is not strong, if they don't have the ability to make uh, extended hollow shapes and extended arch shapes where the body position is very strong, um, improving in the lines that we're trying to demonstrate today is going to be very difficult. They're very strong and punchy in their core, <laughs> through their hands and their feet. Okay, from there, just basic hollow body shaping. Just some different variations than what we saw on bars. This is just using a ball board. The ball boards are not necessary. Um, but just simply anytime you can set up something that's interesting, the kids tend to, to want to do it a little bit more. Variety is the spice of life. The more variety they have, the more they, they tend to enjoy it. Okay, and these are just out, out, in, ins we call them, and that's from an elbow plank position. As you see, when the, when the gymnast's hands go out, that's an excellent shape that we're going to need to start perfecting if we want to make our back handsprings longer, okay, or our front handsprings longer getting some of the arch out of our tumbling. That's going to be one of the themes for today's lecture, is trying to get that arch out and to make them longer as they, as they go across the diagonal. Okay, then just a little more advanced version where we're trying to pick up one arm and one leg, and that really incorporates a lot of the little muscles on the side of their core. Uh, which are very important in tumbling when it comes to round offs and cartwheels and things of that nature. The sides of their bodies need to be very strong also. A uh, little more advanced version with the panel mats. We showed these earlier on bars with some smaller panel mats. The other thing that can really accomplish this is those uh, ab wheels. They've got the type where, you, where they don't have any resistance and then also I just saw a commercial in, in my room during lunch. But they have that one developed by the Navy SEAL that actually helps them coil back and all that stuff, so you want to spend a bunch of money to get that one. Uh, but hands and feet. So the first one would be trying to get our hands further away from our feet, and this one is, is training muscles to get your feet further away from your hands. So what would be incorporated in back tumbling versus front tumbling? Okay, as we need to be strong in the hollow for snap downs and things like that, we also need to be strong on the back side of our bodies. The strength on the, on the sides of the bodies are as equal as possible. Also, being strong on the back side of the body has become more important than ever as we're con continuing to increase the demands we place on our athletes with front tumbling skills. Okay, as they're doing front layouts and they're doing connected front layouts, if the, if the back side of their body is not strong, you're going to run into some back injuries. So making sure that their core and their back are equally as strong and that you're working both sides of the body when you're as I mentioned earlier, if you were here, the higher the arms are placed on these types of repetitions, the more difficult the exercise becomes. If the gymnast's hands are lower in a position like that, the repetition is, is easier, and, 
if they, as they raise their arms to an intermediate or to an overhead position, the exercise becomes a little bit more difficult. But you can see easily why this would be important. Front, you know, front handsprings, front layouts, things of that nature, the glutes, the upper hamstrings, and the lower back need to be very, very strong. Other exercises that you can do would be arch-ups where you're hanging over a ball table or something of that, of that nature, driving the heels over the head. I don't recommend um, overly large shapes when you're doing that, not a lot of arching when you're doing those types of things, just really smaller little Little style repetitions is a much better way to, to approach those. I think sometimes if you do too much, it almost gets a little bit hyper and, it, and they can injure themselves. Okay, so basically like always, just four or five little things that I'm trying to make sure that the kids are have show some proficiency in before we start tackling these things. Okay, the first thing we're going to do, and it's going to be pretty quick, is going to be the hurdle. And the hurdle is something that I know that as I, as I was coming up as a coach, I probably didn't spend as much time on as I, as I should have. I think that it's, it's something that sometimes we kind of pass through. And if, if you pass through it too quickly and you don't get it to where it's correct early enough in their development, you can pay for it later on down the road. And that comes from personal um, experiences. We've had kids that you know, are starting to get into Zerchenko development or advanced balance beam dismount development. And their hurdle being off can really become a problem. So you want to make sure that if you're starting to see that as they're developing in levels two, three, and four, even five, if it is not being afraid to take a step backwards, being afraid to, you know, kind of refresh their memory on what we're looking for as far as, as far as her hurdling is concerned, making sure that they're skipping straight and that they're able to accelerate out of a hurdling. Okay? The way that I work on it and, and, and most of our coaches do is we try to keep it as simple as possible. And keeping it simple as possible is, is swinging the arms to cover the ears and then bringing the toe to either the ankle or the knee on a hurdle. Um, keeping them low and compact and moving forward. The, the days of, of hurdling you, where you kind of flare it and you open your arms up, that works for some kids. It works for men quite a bit, but for little compulsory girls, I think that a lower, forward moving, more compact hurdle is the way to go. Uh, it gets them their momentum moving in the direction they want to go. To me, especially with younger, lighter bodied kids, if they do that stand up type hurdle, they're working against themselves because their momentum has gone from horizontal to vertical. So it actually slows them down. Okay, but this is just simple little positioning exercises. You can use a partner. Uh, the wall works out great. Stall bars, trapezoids, vault tables, whatever you can do to kind of lock your hands onto something. Just getting them the feeling of leaning forward really trying to, to kind of use detail as far as covering their ears. And you're going to hear me say that a hundred times today. Trying to keep their ears covered while they're tumbling. When they do a hurdle, they cover their ears. When they do a round off, we're covering our ears. When we're doing our back handsprings, cover your ears. Back extension roll, front handspring, setting for back tucks. All of those things is trying to get your ears inside of your arms. And, and, and Covering your ears sometimes isn't the best terminology. I went to a camp last summer. And I told a little girl that when she's doing her back handspring, she needs to work on covering her ears. And she goes, well, wouldn't I land on my head? I said, yeah, if you did that, you would land on your head. So let's try to do it with uh, straight arms instead. But just uh, never assume, in other words, in, in what we do. Um, real quickly, just out of a little power hurdle, this is just the drill that I actually do with kids on vault in our, with our upper levels. I have a gymnast that's going to be a level 10 next year, hopefully. She hurdles a little bit crooked every once in a while, so on the way back, as she's vaulting and doing her drills, she does this. And this is just trying to ensure that both kneecaps are moving forward, that the arm swing is even on both sides. In other words, if one arm goes up higher than the other, that could create problems. Making sure that the skip is low and consistent, that they're on the balls of their feet, they're light on their feet, and that they're, they're really getting into that ears-covered position. Okay? From there, we work on multiple hurdles. So the gymnast is just learning how to swing and stop their arms to where the momentum continues to move forward. Probably not as tilted as you would like if they were doing a round-off, but the reason why they're not tilting any further than that is because they're intelligent. Okay? If they did it on that drill, they would fall on their face. All right, so just trying to get them in that position. 
really getting the rhythm and the timing of what a hurdle is like. Okay, and as simple as this looks, this is definitely a little more advanced, but run, hurdle, sprint. And what we're trying to accomplish here is to run out of the corner, to perform a hurdle, and then try to have that hurdle not lose momentum or speed. If their hurdle is, is eating up speed, especially as they're doing you know, intermediate or advanced tumbling or learning how to vault your chancos, um, obviously that's not going to be very productive, very efficient if you're slowing down right in the area where you need to actually be accelerating the most. So this run hurdle sprint is a really good drill, but for little kids that are still kind of fumbly on their feet, this can lead to some tripping, so I would definitely be very careful with it. Okay, but again, just trying to accelerate out of that hurdle. All right, moving into roundoffs. And as I spoke about the hurdle, worth a lot of time in development, making sure that this is done properly. I think spending maybe twice as much time as you might think is necessary is going to be time very well spent. Okay, really developing the round off and making sure that it's, that it's very efficient, that the arm positioning is correct, that they are going straight over the top in a round off. And you'll see a lot of the little things that we do as far as like complex or warm up or, or activities are concerned as far as, as making sure that the kids are getting lots of numbers on round offs in ways that lend themselves to doing a lot of repetition in a fun and interesting way. The first thing in the way that I, I develop our kids round offs is through a sidecar wheel. And it's, it's a very simple way to do it. I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about hand positions. So if you're gonna ask me a question about the hand position, don't. Because I think that it takes care of itself. Okay, a round off is something where it's, it's it, derives from a side cartwheel, and then the rounding off of the body as they start to develop and get better at it uh, is something that, again, takes care of itself. You don't have to spend a lot of time teaching your kids on, on put this hand here and then at a 30 degree quarter angle, make sure that your head is in the correct trajectory with your thumb and that, that stuff's gonna drive you nuts and it's gonna drive them even more nuts. Okay, so just finding ways to Simply teach them how to do it is the best in my opinion. The things that I talk about constantly with round offs is head position and eye position. First thing we tell them is not to look down their first arm or the first hand that they place on the floor, but to look down or slightly inside of the second hand that they place on the floor. If they look down their first arm, and this goes for Sukahara style vaulting also, typically their head is going to be out of alignment. And that is when the round off is going to come around the side. Okay, so if they look down the second arm, and you'll see a really good illustration with, throughout this video of the kids doing a really good job of that. So mainly you'll see very straight round offs from these guys. Um, but it's looking down the second arm, and then making sure that the second leg that comes over the top is directly over the top of their ponytail. Okay, it's a really great way to say it to them. Okay, so we're looking down our second arm, and then the second leg is coming directly over the top of your ponytail. If those two things happen, most of the time you're going to get a very, very straight round off. Okay, but side cartwheels, very simply, looking down the second arm, and trying to get, make sure that that second leg is coming over the top of the hips for the side cartwheels. Snap downs, and these tend to be very ugly, but they are a necessary evil. We need to learn how to, we need to teach the kids to be able to get up off of their hands. And you can make this more easy, more simple for the kids by having them do it off of a panel mat or getting their hands up a little bit to where they're snapping actually down a couple of, of levels. That'll make it a lot easier in the beginning. But basically coming off of their hands and learning how to snap is very important when it comes to round offs, back handsprings, and then also coming out of back handsprings into flipping as they get to that level. Okay, so just real quick. And we, we cover that during round offs because a lot of times kids struggle with getting off of their hands. All right, we already have a round off now as we spoke about. These are trying to make them better. First thing we're gonna look at is the shape in their core as they're doing the round off. A big problem that we see a lot of that really creates issues when going into back handsprings is the shape that their core is in or their middle is in. As we spoke about earlier with, with the arms being down when we're doing certain conditioning drills, arms being lower as they come out of a round off as they're developing them or improving them is going to really help with keeping their core stabilized and not with their butt sticking out and their ribs sticking out which we see so much of 
if we have kids that are just learning round offs and they're trying to land them with their arms out. You can all picture what I mean? If they land and they're in that really not very good position. That position surely does not lend itself to doing a very powerful backhand spring out of it. So I developed this a few years ago in kind of watching a lot of advanced tumbling where you, where you see, um, especially men, out of round offs, they drop their arms going into their back handsprings almost as like a coil. You're not gonna get too many compulsory kids that can do that because they're not fast enough to. Um, but by training the round off that way, you'll notice what it's forcing the gymnast in the front to do. The shaping that she's using is very good. As she gets better at it, you go ahead and start lifting up the arms um, and hopefully the first drill will lend itself to the second one and you'll have that nice internal core shape as they're doing this stuff. But every drill that you'll see, we're gonna show them with the arms down and then with the arms up. I'm not doing a whole lot of tumbling stuff with our upper level kids now. I've got a coach that's doing that more. But when I did do it, I did, I did a lot of complex work with just round offs off of panel mats. We would always do uh, five round offs with their arms down would be the first thing that they would do inside of that complex. Okay, just refreshing their memory of what it feels like to get the feet through what it feels like to have that core in, the hips starting to, to curl under, to give them the ability to accelerate horizontally, okay? And it's, it's really a great drill. It's a really great way to get it done. You kind of see what I mean here? It's landing with those arms down, trying to get that core to curl a little bit. That gymnast is doing a really good job of keeping the arms up and, and accomplishing it in the core, but a lot of times when you're dealing with lower level athletes, that becomes a, a big challenge. So by lowering the arms, it, it alleviates a little bit of the tension and it allows for them to, again, curl the hips. Okay, really good illustration of the alignment that we're looking for going into the hand placement right there. Okay, ears are covered, eyes are forward where they wanna place their hands. We're gonna look down the second arm seeing that or slightly inside of the second arm that also will create that that ax, axis rotation that they're going to need to do the round off also and it's tougher as they're younger but one of the things that you should be drilling on round offs and front hand springs is getting the feet together as late as possible the later the feet come together the more rotation the skill is going to have if you get the feet together early it, it, it inhibits rotation a little bit and makes it tougher you watch the great tumblers of the world and the great vaulters that are doing round offs onto the ball board, those feet are coming together almost right at the last second. That's tough to get the little guys to do, but something to definitely keep in mind as you're working up the, up the ladder of levels. And she's doing a pretty good job. Feet were getting together very late. Okay, if you've got kids with, with uh, round offs that are not necessarily straight, setting up an environment which uh, really urges them to straighten out quickly is something that really works. Using tape lines, all those things are wonderful. But when you set up a tunnel, is what we call this, okay. setting up a tunnel, this is gonna really give them that visual that you want them going straight. The other thing that really works is doing cartwheels or round offs with their belly facing towards a wall, standing fairly close to it. So if you can imagine a kid that's kicking around the side constantly, if you put them belly up against a wall and make them do a cartwheel, that sucker's coming over the top, I promise you. Okay, so it's a really fast way to get them to learn that. Okay, so arms down, and then arms up. Also, you're noticing that most of the stuff at this level, I believe in teaching from a stand, okay, not from a run or a power hurdle. Running and power hurdling makes it easier, so it, it allows them to make compensations and not have to use exceptional technique. Running can screw up a lot of things with tumbling because it makes mistakes almost go away because they can use momentum as their ally. So if you teach out of a stand or like this, with the arms up by the ears, that front leg horizontal, I really like how that drop helps develop the round off, that leaning into the lunge, that, that kind of the timing and the process that that creates, I think is really, really good when it comes to round offs. So you'll see a lot of that from that standing position in this lecture. And then trying to picture the core shape of the gymnast with her arms down versus the gymnast with her arms up. We want them to be the same. If the gymnast that's got their arms up were to start to stick her butt out or stick her ribs out, 
we try to go back to that preliminary drill. Okay, but really having a good illustration of the second leg coming right over the top of where the ponytail was. Okay, if that leg were to be anywhere off axis, that's where you're, you're going to run into problems. A lot of times it becomes off axis because of the first thing that we mentioned, which was the head position. If the head position is in, looking down the second arm, it's very easy to kick the heel over the top of the ponytail. If your head is sticking out, not so, not so much. Okay? Trying to get up off, off, off of their hands with a little more dynamics. That's simply just a panel mount with one or two panels unfolded, creating a little bit of a mountain there. And just in, in multiples, just having them doing round offs over the top. And all these little stations I like because you can set them up in not a lot of space and you can have them doing multiple round offs in a row, almost lending itself to some conditioning. You'll see a little maze that I do, I, I did when I was making this, this video. We haven't done it for a while, but it's a really great way to do lots of numbers of something in a, in a controlled environment where you can kind of see a lot of kids doing one thing at the same time, and it's really great for their uh, floor cardio. Yeah. If, if you have a gymnast that's, that's sticking stuff out, okay, or not coming over the top, let's say I put my, my right hand down first. Okay, I would want to have the gymnast standing here and trying to do a side cartwheel with their belly facing the wall. Okay, and that wall there is going to really encourage them to make sure that it's coming up over the top. For a round off, you want to be a little bit further away, but it really helps them with the idea. Or use a wall and then a box or a panel mat, creating a tunnel where you can really get the kids coming over the top. Yeah. We did on like our resi pit, we just went sideways. Resi pit sideways, excellent. Anything that you can do, it's kind of got to be higher than their feet to really drive it home, like that tunnel drill is great, but their feet, if they go sideways, aren't really going to hit it. That would be a lot better, okay? All right, so round offs over a little, little uh, mountain thing there. Spotting blocks work great. If you have kids that, that refuse to stretch the length of their round off, doing things like this work, I wouldn't start with something that has a drop off in it, to be honest. If you're going to do this with kids that are younger, okay, these are level level five, level six gymnasts at the time that they were doing this video. Um, the best thing to start with would be chalk lines. Okay, have a chalk line, have them do the round off. Their hands go to this chalk line, and we're going to try to get our feet to fly over that chalk line. The one thing that you also have to guard against, though, when doing these types of drills, if you make your round off too long with the wrong type of gymnast, meaning they're not very dynamic and not very fast, you could really hurt their ability to get the round off turned over. Okay, so there's a fine line when working with these types of drills. You don't want it too long or their back handspring is going to suffer, but we also have to start teaching them how to get longer in their shapes so that when they do want to change their momentum from horizontal to vertical, like when they start learning their back tucks and their layouts, they're, they're able to, to stretch the second half of the skill to give them that block angle where they're going to be able to set and to go up into their into their flipping. Okay, so kind of a drill that, that works, but also be careful that it doesn't too much interfere with the, with the rotational aspect of round offs. The, the thing I'm really liking about this is is noticing just the the detail and the quality of work that the kids are putting out, the extension. From fingers to toes to, to just every single aspect of it, I think they're really taking pride in their work. And that really, of course, is going to go a long way when it comes to this stuff. So trying to do things, and I use the word multiples, don't do it in multiples unless you're doing multiples of things that are, that are at the highest level of quality. Okay, because we talked about muscle memory. You don't want to be doing something over and over and over again incorrectly because that's how bad habits are formed. Really good illustration of looking down that second arm or inside the second arm. Round offs from one knee. And this really uh, works on, again, the squareness of their round offs. This almost automatically wants to pull them off center. So they're going to really have to hone in their technique as far as their head position and driving the second leg over the top of the ponytail again. Okay, you notice this gymnast is on a line. So that gives her that visual with her first hand second hand, of course, and then also following that arm, but also gives her a reference point for where she wants the second leg to come over. 
this is the ultimate of not having any momentum. Okay, because even the drill with their leg up, that, that lean and step gives them a little bit of momentum going into it. This really makes it difficult. And anytime you have an ability as a coach, once they are prepared enough, is try to make the drills more difficult than the skill itself. If you can find ways to challenge them in that regard, as they start to improve, they're going to get uh, a lot more out of their, their the skills themselves if the drill work is is more difficult than the actual skill. And we do a lot of that as far as um, is things on all the events. It's, it's, it's similar to like, why do we do timers up on vault? Because we want the timer to, to challenge them. We want to work almost beyond what they consider to be attainable and normal. We want to really force the issue. So, uh, this drill is really good for that. Okay, so good head position, second arm, and then driving the leg over the top and finishing with a good core, trying to move horizontally. Okay, and also trying to, you guys see in the punching and the rebounding, we're hoping that that is what's going to take place when we add the back handspring, not that drop the butt thing that creates the frog flop. Okay, so really, it's really looking at what their round offs are like without the round, without the back handspring being present. And then once they start doing back handsprings, is comparing in your mind on video, whatever you've got, and making sure that they're round off in the, when it's by itself, and then the round off when it's when it's got a back handspring added are similar. You don't want that to change too much. Okay? This is the setup we use for that complex I was mentioning. That's round offs, arms down, it's round offs, arms up. A couple of days a week when I was doing a lot of the tumbling. Um, we would start with five arms down, five arms up, five round off back handsprings, five round off two back handsprings, and then five round off back handsprings and a flip. Whether that was a tuck, a layout, some of our kids could even do folds and things of that nature. But a really good way to build power from a standing position. And then because they're elevated on those panel mats, it almost makes it, it mandatory that their rotation is going to improve because their hands are a little bit higher. Okay, and this is just a little maze. Not that we do a ton of this, but it's, it's just a very interesting way when you've got some drills set up to have the kids doing something over and over and over again in a manner that all, would not only work the skill itself, but that would help them with um, floor cardiovascular improvement, okay? Working on the conditioning that they'll need for their uh, floor routines. If you had a bunch of kids and a bunch of things set up, you can imagine doing that for two or three minutes at a very high pace, and it would get them tired. You also want to see what their what their skills are going to look like as they fatigue a little bit, and it's important to condition them when they're when they're fatigued and trying to work skills when they're fatigued because if they, especially as they get into optionals, they have a third floor pass. They're not going to be doing that pass while they're all fresh to daisy. So it's going to be important that they're that they're drilling and improving the shaping of their skills even when they're a little bit tired. Okay. All right, moving on to back handsprings. And this, the, the main thing here is going to be trying as much as we can to get a lot of the arch out. Getting that short, again, frog flop that we get from our level ones and twos. We start to spread it out a little bit with our threes and fours. How do we really make it long in level five so that their feet are getting back a little bit and we can create that angle where we can really take off into our back tucks, okay? First thing is the directional. Um, the directional movement of a back handspring, uh, nothing goes forward. And this drill can, can be done with a resi, it can be done with an eight inch or against the wall, or you can use a spotter. I would not do this with kids that are silly, uh, because simply stated, the kid in the back is probably going to step aside and you're going to have a big laugh <laughs> and the kid in the front with a broken arm. Um, but a really good drill for getting the kids to understand the arm swing and which direction the push goes in. Okay, this is a great drill for cheerleaders too. Anyone have to work with cheerleaders? Okay, that's a really good drill to get them to understand the power needed, the timing of the arms and the jump in a very controlled environment for you. If they're, if they're a little bit larger, if you can imagine a mat up against the wall, that would work just as well. They can't tilt back as much as they can with a partner, which is why I like the partner variation but it, it does accomplish a lot when it comes to the arm swing and the timing of the arms and the legs. 
for whatever reason, when, you know, when cheerleaders want to come in, they've never done gymnastics in their whole life, and they want to learn a back handspring in a half an hour. Okay? Um, probably not possible, but one of the things, a troubleshooting thing that you can really get them to understand that they're probably not ready is that type of drill. Okay, where they're, they're not going to be able to time it correctly. They're not going to show you a whole lot of dynamics and power. Does anyone know what I did with that? Okay, never mind. That's fast. All right. All right. We're going to the next drill. And this is just back handsprings down an incline. Because all of this stuff can be spotted at first. Okay, so this is, these guys were past that point. But we're, we're you know, using an incline to try to increase um, length. We're trying to increase rotation. We're trying to work on head position, getting the arch out, all of those things. That can also be accomplished with a spotter. Don't be afraid to do that. But as I spoke of on bars, spotting is a wonderful thing that we need to use. But if you use it too much, the kids learn to rely on it. They don't get to accomplish it by themselves. You're getting really strong. They're typically not. And it's not going to create the best opportunity for learning. Okay, so creating safe, soft situations where they can do things themselves is the ultimate. And trying to spot as little as possible when it comes to tumbling. Really working on trying to get the ears covered. Shoulder flexibility will, will play a role in this. So if you see uh, that gymnast there, her shoulders are not nearly as flexible, so she struggles with trying to get her arms back a little bit, but still doing a decent job. And this gymnast is doing a really good job of showing shoulder flexibility and is able to cover her ears very well. Okay, these aren't as long as we're going to possibly want to see them as we add momentum and round offs. From a standing position, if you can get your kids doing a tight arch into a into a, a block hollow and not a pike, you're really doing a good job with them. Okay, this this is hard to do with the proper shaping. They have to really be strong jumpers. Their shaping has to be great. Their dynamics, as far as what we showed with the inverted pogos and the ability to get off their hands, all has to be very good. But just anytime you're working down an incline, it gives them that little bit of assistance, a little bit of confidence. And it gives them the ability to lengthen those shapes. <laughs> so we're trying to get the arch out of the lower back. It's okay. It's pretty good there. Heads out a little. But I like that. And you go and you do that with a lot of your little guys. By the time they get there, their feet, instead of being pointed that way, are going to be pointed straight down the lane. Okay, and that's not going to lend itself to moving on. Okay? All right, um, creating length, and this is just a little drill. Um, I actually see our coaches doing quite a bit of this, and it's just using a little bit of a chalk line or a tape line where they're going to do a back handspring. You make a mark of where their hands were, and then you try to get them to go further. Okay, and this is kind of a really exaggerated version of sandbagging a little bit. She knew exactly what she was about to do. So she does it. The gymnast marks her, her thing. Now watch this magic. <laughs> I am such a good coach. <laughs> okay, but obviously it wouldn't be like that immediately. She's done that before. But anytime you're using contests, anytime you can, you can find like external ways to motivate the kids through contests, through partner games, through just little things like this. Who can get their hands the furthest? We're going to make a mark and we're going to give you a gummy bear. You know, whatever. Whatever, whatever it turns out to be. But just trying to create that Competitive nature is always a good thing. Making it fun. Okay? All right, this one is, a, is another good one. She's not touching me right there, thankfully. Looks like she's gouging my eyes out. Um, but basically what I've got there is my hands on her ankles, and all I'm going to do on a standing back handspring is give her a little bit of a flick or a little bit of assistance to try to get her feet to accelerate, to get her to feel what we're looking for as far as increasing the speed of her lower half. They can usually generate a lot of power in their upper body because of the arm swing, but until they're dynamic, sometimes the back handspring runs out of gas a little bit, okay, because they don't know how to change quickly from that arch shape to the hollow. So this just gives them a little bit of help. It's just me simply flicking her feet. And you can see the feet are going pretty good. So just me giving her that small little push really helps to get those feet through and get them down. Okay, so that's a really good drill. 
for them to feel kind of what you're looking for. And as they start to connect round offs and back handsprings, that'll really help. That's surgical tubing. Tammy Biggs was doing a lot of that stuff for a long time. They hate that. That's not fun. So I don't recommend doing a whole lot of it. But if you've got a gymnast that's kind of being impossible when it comes to making corrections as far as keeping their ears covered, that will definitely get them locked into that uh, philosophy. Uh, no pun intended. Um, and also, uh, it gives them the ability to really work on keeping the head neutral, not whipping the head backwards. So it is good. This is not for your class kids, for your level ones, twos, threes, or even fours. A lot of times kids, unless they have that arm swing, they go to do a back handspring and they are going to crunch. Okay, you don't want them to break fingers and hurt their wrists because you were trying to fix something uh, you know, that is very difficult to fix in the first place. Okay, but just an illustration of what's out there that you can do, and we're going to blast past that pretty quickly. But, but it is good, and I would def definitely recommend if you're going to do it, spotting it at first. Okay? <laughs> Snap down back handsprings. Here we're trying to get her to not squat down quite as much. So we'll see if she does a little better job. Trying to catch it, not so hot, but you get the idea of now transitioning from the round off to the back handspring. Nice line there, trying to snap and rebound into the back handspring. A little better, but a good job of keeping her arms covering her ears and a pretty good core. Okay, from there, and again using some of that arms down technique to keep the, keep the shape in. It's an extension of what we showed earlier on the round offs which is from that start position with ears covered, lean and round off back handspring, trying to accelerate and lengthen. Accelerate and lengthen. Okay, she under-rotated that round off a bit we saw, so the back handspring was a little bit high. That's a mat we no longer have, but it's um, about a four inch or six inch mat by about six feet or so. And we're now using pit pillows for that drill. If you guys are familiar with pit pillows, I think Pummel Track makes them like blue denim eight inch mats that are fantastic and they make them these smaller sizes like this so again you can use a target for the kids as far as creating a, a station where they're working on stretching the shape of the back handspring. This is also very good for introductory your chanko work. Okay so look down that second arm, cover, lock, cover. Okay really really good drill for that. If the kids are smaller, turn the mat sideways. Okay, when you get kids, uh, take, a, take a regular eight incher, turn it sideways, and it's almost the same length as that little mat was. Okay, that thing's just it's been shredded and it's no longer in our possession. But uh, anything you can get that's that size, I really recommend. And then it would be lying down the center of the tumble track and doing multiple backhand springs, trying to increase the speed and the length of each one. Okay, you can play little games with that, making marks. You can get the furthest with three back handsprings. You can get the furthest with four. Who can do, do four back handsprings the fastest? You know, just things of that nature and really cranking it. And if you get just a few, three or four kids working on those types of drills, again, you can kind of build in the cardio aspect of it as well. I'm trying to look for ears covered on both sides, trying to get the arch out and making it as long as possible. All right, back tucks. The biggest thing here and, and the biggest challenge we all face, number one is head position. A lot of our kids these days, they're, they're getting going from level four to level five. As coaches, we have no idea they had a freaking trampoline in their backyard. And they already have a built-in huge problem, which is that they zing their heads backwards when they do back tucks because their friend Sophie taught them that. <laughs> okay, so how do we combat that? We have to get our momentum moving from horizontal to vertical without moving our heads. The key to that is, is what I call setting. We all call it setting. We talk about setting. What setting? Set this, set that. Okay, a lot of times as coaches we know what it is, but our athletes don't have any idea what we're talking about. They're nodding their heads. And they're saying yes. <laughs> But they're really just thinking about getting away from you as soon as possible and getting back in the corner to talk to their friends. Okay? Setting, for them to understand setting is very important. They got to get what it means. And setting to me is 
the place in the tumbling pass where we change the movement from horizontal to vertical and how we accomplish that. Number one is getting your feet behind you. And then number two, it's where you stop your arms to not allow your shoulders to get behind your hips, okay? If your shoulders get behind your hips and you're doing a flip and you've got a whip back, that's when you're gonna run into issues in level five. And again, you can thank the trampoline manufacturers around the world, all right? But trying to get the kids to understand setting. The best way, and I watch our coaches do it all the time, is standing back tuck work, starting in a pit. Getting them to understand setting. Never doing flipping first out of a backhand spring, or God forbid, out of a round off when they're at this age. But I see it so much when I go around to other people's gyms, it just, it just makes me sad. The kids are learning how to do round off back flips. Okay, it's going to mess up their back tuck, it's going to mess up their backhand, it's going to probably gonna mess up their so what you're going to end up with is a fantastic cheerleader, okay? If you want them to be a gymnast, I say that with all the love in my heart. Um, you, you want to create a good gymnast or someone that can tum tumble for the long term, you want them to learn their back flips out of round off back handsprings, okay? Standing back tucks to me is the best way to get them moving in that direction because it teaches them that they have to use their arms and getting up and also stopping the momentum from going backwards. Back handsprings, we want them to swing their arms and let their shoulders go. We've, gone, we've done that now in level two, three, four. Now we're level fives, we gotta get them to swing their arms and now stop them for their shoulders that don't do that. And that can be very challenging. So I recommend starting their back tucks much earlier than you think you're gonna need them. Once they can do a strong round off back handspring, then you can start the development of back tucks You've got a pit off the edge of a pit, into the foam, onto a mat, into a resi, wherever. But starting to spot them, this panel mat is a great, is a great um, way to do that if, if you're a strong enough spotter. But just getting the kids doing them, where they're stopping their arms, creating that inability to get their shoulders back, and going up. Okay, for the purpose of this video, and she's stopping hers a little earlier than I would like, we're going to talk about setting late. Setting late means getting their arms all the way up by their ears. So once again, going down that covering your ears philosophy. If they stop them too early, typically in, in this level of compulsories, they're not going to be able to get the rotation that they need. Okay? When we get to be optional level athletes, we have to learn how to set much earlier at a steeper angle to lessen rotation so we can increase twist and do all those things we're going to need down the road. But for the purpose of this lecture, and there'll be some pretty pretty good illustrations of it, we're looking for the set to be a little bit later or more hands above their eyes. Okay, so anywhere from hands above their eyes to vertical is what I'm kind of looking for here. Okay, so let's see if she does it. Okay, really good. Straight arms, bent arms, I don't care. Personal preference. Some people like it to be straight arms all the time. I think if you once you start seeing kids doing advanced twisting, you're gonna see a lot of setting where the arms are crowned a little bit and not necessarily robot straight. Okay, both, both work. This girl is going to use bent arms and the other girl is going to use straight arms. Both work. Okay, so just kind of use what you think you'd like to, to see in your program and go from there. That's kind of a cool little pause. Okay, but getting, getting the hands above the eyes and trying not to drop the shoulders back too much. Okay, so pretty good there. Slight tilt of the hips outward. That also is called a hip set in, in many coaches' worlds. The hip set is something where you're pushing the hips out slightly, and the changing from that tight arch to whatever shape is going to follow is what creates the rotation of the body. Okay, so that's not arching in a bad way. That's actually a necessity. And again, we call it a hip set. Okay, down an incline. That was a really early set. You guys see what I mean? Okay, so there, I wouldn't have been real happy with that. And that was very good. Okay? So here, we're stopping it too soon. Not bad. Not a bad result. That's a tough drill. I would definitely spot that first. And I really like that. 
okay? So slight flexion of the knees, so rebounding into it, and then getting the arms all the way up by the ears. From there off the tumble track, a little bit early. Okay, here, tumble track, and I, I spoke to this, Angie's one of our, our optional tumbling coaches, works a lot with floors, our compulsory kids. We've got another coach that works with our upper level kids, and, and there's, there's a, always a, a obvious positive to tumble track, but there's also some inherent things built in that can be, can be a problem. You're gonna notice that as they tumble on a tumble track, their set is gonna be a little bit earlier than it would be on the floor. That's because the tumble track provides a lot of momentum and a lot of lift. And if they were to tumble hard down the tumble track and set late, they are going to crash on their head. Okay, so they make the compensation that I don't want to rotate that hard. So I, with that said, I'm going to stop my arms a little bit early, and I'm going to do um, a back tuck in that manner. So just watching them on the tumble track versus what you'll see on the floor in a minute, you're going to see a little bit earlier set, although we like that one quite a bit. And that's the bent arm variation, but you can see where her arms were they kind of were up by her, her eyes. And then there, a little bit early. Okay? And then on the floor itself, from a slight run, what do you think, early? Mm -hmm. Same gymnast? A little better? I think this one's pretty good. Three different little versions from her, um, one a little bit early, then one a little bit better, and then probably the one you'd be looking for, in my opinion, for athletes of this level, which would be the current level five. All right, moving on to front handsprings. What do we have for time? What time does this end? 15. All right, we're going to have to fly. The good thing about being able to fly now is that these are all basically the same drills as we did for back handsprings. So it's the same... Same circle, same stuff, okay? Down inclines is a very good way to do it. Here, head position is very, very important. The head needs to stay slightly back on front handsprings. If the head comes forward, that's when you're gonna get the kids squatting down and their chest flying forward. So the head position needs to stay back with the hands. Head back, hands back, as long as possible. The finishing of a good front handspring is kind of like a front limber. So, hint, hint, train front limbers. Okay, but doing them from a stand and finishing in that type of position is very difficult. So that also kind of lends itself to what we were saying earlier, making the drill harder than the skill itself. And when you add run to an athlete that can do a front handspring from a stand, you're gonna have a monster, okay? You can teach them how to tumble from a stationary position, you're gonna add that momentum and you're gonna really like what you see. If you teach it from a run, they really have nowhere to go from there, except for running faster. And that's not the best method in my opinion. Okay, from a raised surface, for panel mats. Really focused on the, on the lunge, driving the heel over the top, getting the legs together as late as they can, loving it, how late those feet are coming together. And then the hard part, which is the head position. Again, if they whip their head down as they're coming in for the landing, they're going to get very squatty. They're not going to have the ability to follow it with a rebound or even better, another skill. Okay, going up the incline, a little bit more difficult, or up the raised surface. Spot those at first also. Over a gap. If they're, if they're going short, I recommend tape lines and, and chalk. Probably a little more than I would recommend this at first. Because if they miss, that probably wouldn't feel so hot. Okay, but really liking how late the feet are coming together and then the head positions. Okay, back extension rolls. Very important in development. It's the one thing that really helps bar coaches a lot. So floor coaches, please, please spend your time on your back extension rolls and help us out. Starting with a straight arm backward roll to a push up or a prone position. Working on head position and locked arms. Also is by, by lessening the degree of expectation as far as handstand is concerned, they're able to keep their core in. That's the main thing you're trying to accomplish as you're doing the progressions. The 
The second they start letting their ribs out and they start arching, their feet are going to go the opposite direction that you want them to go in, and you're going to end up with a pretty sloppy product. So making sure that the arms are locked and making sure that the core and the ribs and the chest stay in. Okay, down and incline makes it easier than just using the floor itself. Our floor coaches do a fantastic job with these. Um, our kids do them very, very well. I attribute that to number one, the, the time that they spend on it. Number two, the, uh, our, our kids are fairly strong, and a back extension roll is a strength style skill. They need to be very strong to do it properly. And this is just isolating the positions, taking the roll out of the equation, similar to us taking the run out of the equation when it came to the tumbling. If they have to do it from a position where they're, where they're not having a lot of momentum to rely on, then they have to rely on the technique. They have to rely on technique and they get better faster. Yeah? Um, what's the reason why? So where are they moving their mild and moving forward? Uh, a neutral head position and as they come up and over the top. Yeah, where their eyes go? Yeah, on the hands. <laughs> yeah, and then the eyes can drop down as they complete it, looking where their feet would go. But yeah, I think that it's important <laughs> to look at their hands as they're coming up over the top. If they bury their head too much, their feet are going to tend to come over too quickly to mark the handstand. So more of a neutral head position following the, the line of the arms is my recommendation. Yeah, that's a really good illustration. Her head is neutral, ears are covered, and she's kind of looking at her fingers there at the top of her hands. And then finding with her eyes where she's going to put her foot down. The incline also, guys, forces them to open up a little bit early. They open up late with the momentum, they're not going to nearly hit a handstand. So once you get kids hitting handstands down an incline, you're really starting to get that earlier open. And as you transition that to the flat floor, you're going to end up with a really good product there. Okay, very neutral head, I really like that. Ears covered the entire time, keeping the ribs in. Okay, drill off the panel mat in two different ways. You saw her, her, her hands were out pretty far, and this gymnast's hands are very close. Okay, one, they both work. Uh, I think that the one, this one's a little bit more um, suitable for your younger athletes because the hands get a little bit further and the end of the panel mat kind of boosts their shoulders. The second variation where her hands are really close. It's a little bit more difficult, um, but really good as far as, as getting the kids to really lock their arms out. You notice her hands are really close, and that really, the, the pop is coming off of her forearms, where the first gymnast, the pop is really more coming off of their shoulders. And what I mean by pop is the kind of the assistance that the mat is giving them to get them that boost. Okay, some more shoulder blades here. And then this gym has simply moved up a little bit, and her, her, she's getting more boost off of her forearms. Okay, so that's a little bit more difficult as they move along. All right, and then a finished product. Just trying to create what we were able to do with the, with the drills that gave us a little bit of assistance. Mainly what we're looking for is that full opening, that neutral head position, and a really straight line at the top. Not letting anything stick out. <coughs> Keeping it in. Okay? A little bit past vertical, so what we would coach her to do is to try to open her shoulders a little bit sooner. Okay? We nailed it. Any questions? All right, thanks guys. Wow.